Good morning, Eagle Heights Cathedral, and welcome to today's Sunday celebration service. We are so excited that you have chosen to worship with us today. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and you can watch our live services on YouTube. For more information about the church and how you can get connected, you can visit our website, ehconline.org. Now join us as Bishop Collins delivers a powerful, timely message. Hallelujah. I was going to tell you, if you know there's no God like Jehovah, why don't you act like it? Why don't you clap your hands? Why don't you shout like there's no God like Jehovah? Now, hold on a second. Men, we're going to give them a chance to do that again. But listen to me. Here's the reason why you got to let it out. Because it's not that there's just no God like Jehovah. There is no other God but Jehovah. Open up your mouth and give him a shout he hadn't heard yet. Because he's worthy to be praised. Glory to his name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. My God, my God, my God. Hallelujah. Now, Father, we bless you. We have worshipped you. We have praised you. Now anoint us to give you our undivided attention. Give us ears that hear, eyes that see in the spirit realm. And Father, even though our message is directly directed toward men, may every person under the sound of my voice grab something out of this message and run with it. And Father, I thank you because you always have a word within the word. Thank you that we're going to be changed because your word never fails. It does not return void. It does what you send it to do. And so I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Well, church, it happened again. Hungry patrons at a local buffet in Alabama took hangry, that is hunger and combined with anger to a new level when a fight allegedly broke out over crab legs. The unexpected brawl went down at the Meteor Buffet in Huntsville as diners were waiting to feast on a freshly boiled batch of crab legs. Now among the restaurant goers was a police officer named Gerald Johnson. He said, I recalled hearing yelling and tongs clashing. Literally as I sat down and maybe took two bites out of my plate, I looked up there as a woman who was beating a man. People are moving around, plates are shattering everywhere. It's not something you typically hear if you can imagine fencing match. Of the guests, allegedly, they were using tongs as weapons and asked for why the altercation took place. Everyone was saying, she cut me in line, he cut me in line, I was first. He said they'd been waiting there for the crab legs for a good 10 to 20 minutes. When they finally came out, it was very heated, especially if someone was taking more than their fair share, Johnson said. Following the fight, police arrested John Chapman and Chaquita Jenkins. Chapman sustained a cut on his head while Jenkins was not injured. Both Chapman and Jenkins allegedly admitted to letting temper cloud their judgment. Now, when I hear a story like that, it makes me go back to 1 Corinthians 13 and 11, where Paul says, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I talk like a child, I act like a child. But he said, but when I grew up, now listen, this story also tells me that immaturity knows no gender. But I want to direct my conversation toward men today because we talked about the kind of crises of males in the earth and why there are very few men. And so I want to give you four reasons why I believe that we have all these grown males running around in the world without there being very, very many men. Now, the three of the four that I'm going to give to you come from a book written by Dondre Whitfield, Males Versus Men, but I believe that they prove the point. The first reason that we have a crisis of grown males, number one, is that kids' sports and political correctness. Because of kids' sports and political correctness. Let me explain this. When I was growing up, there were winners and losers. 
It was okay to lose. It meant that you, like all of us, had some more work to do. You had to practice harder and you had to practice better to beat the other guy or the other team. Now, when we were in grade school, if you participated in track, you got a ribbon even if you didn't win. But here's the thing. When you got a pink ribbon, it means you won nothing but you participated. I got one of those pink ribbons one time, and I determined to never get a pink ribbon again. I have all of my ribbons. I have saved all of them. But guess which one I do not have any longer? It is the pink ribbon. But listen to me, church. Something has happened in today's society, and it's not for the better. Let me talk to us for a moment. This has become the era of everyone is a winner, so let's give everyone a medal. And this changing children in general in society, but it's really changing our boys. Watch now. You see, men knows, know that it takes being better, stronger, and faster to have the mindset to compete and win in the real world. For example, when I was growing up, we played basketball. We played what they called Chicago-style basketball. It was called make it, take it. What did that mean? It meant as long as you kept scoring, you kept the basketball. But Chicago-style basketball also meant that if you lost the game, you would get ticked off because you would have to leave the court and you'd have to sit for a long, long long time because you had to wait to play again because so many other people were waiting to get in and as long as you kept winning you stayed on the court and it made me and my friends not give up it made us go back and work harder to hone our skills because we didn't show up to spectate we showed up to play and listen to me church when you lost you were told by the rest of the teams exit stage left get out of here get off the court now listen, it wasn't done in meanness, it was done in competitive mockery and fun. But what we have done is we have created a society of males where we no longer hold one another accountable to make our way to improve our skills no matter our endeavor in life. Listen to what we say. Just give kids what they want because it's not politically correct to help them understand that life handed to you on a silver platter does not make you stronger. It makes you weaker. And it also makes you a detriment to society rather than an asset and a contributor. And most of all, it keeps our young people locked in the tragic state of maleness, which is the major blight on our society in America today. Because I know we don't want to hear this, but everybody look at me. Most of the problems that are caused in America, they are because of males masquerading as men. Number two, there is a crisis of males because of a lack of rites of passage signifying moving from boyhood to malehood. A lack of rites of passage signifying moving from boyhood to malehood. Now let's just have a deeply rooted moment of honesty. In Western civilization, rites of passage are pretty much non-existent. If you want to see how a rite of passage operates, go to Africa. Watch this. According to the Maasai Association, lion hunting was a tradition and historical practice that played an important role in the Maasai culture. The practice was different from trophy hunting. It was symbolically a rite of passage rather than a hobby. When the men took the boys who were coming into their manhood, they separated them from their, mother, their mothers for weeks so that the mother, listen now, would not be able to protect the boy from acts that would be painful but surely necessary for his growth for listen church we cannot grow a male into a man while he is in spaces of accommodation convenience and comfort if amen if there is anything we need to create in our society in America, we need to create modern day rites of passage for our boys that will signal to their minds and their spirits that they are beginning to matriculate into manhood. And listen, these things should not focus on masculinity, they, but on manhood. What is manhood? We learned that being a man is about doing service. Listen, we need to teach our young people, why don't you go out once in a while and serve the homeless? 
How about helping women who don't have a man in their life take care of things in their life? You see, church, these things can become modern-day rites of passage that I promise will have necessary, listen, activation mechanisms for matriculating our boys into manhood. You see, I told you last week that the third symptom of a child is that constant desire to be served. The males want a life of comfort, whereas men, they desire to serve above all else. And we have got to start teaching our young males how to operate as men and learn to serve before they hit the magic number. Everybody look at me. 21 is not the magic number to become a man. I want us to hear this. Our young men have got to understand it's not about a number. It's about a change in the way you order your life. When I was a youth pastor, we taught the young men in our youth group that there are two major things that qualify you for being a man. The first one is you need to learn how to respect authority. Now listen, we would hear young people lipping off to their parents. We didn't let the parents straighten them out. We'd pull them away from the parents, take them in a corner and say, don't talk to your mother that way. Don't you talk to your father that way. The second thing that we did was we taught them, if you want to be a man, men understand, you need to learn how to respect and serve the opposite sex. Now, yeah, I know the ladies going to help me. Some of you men are going to help me, but most of the men just looking at me like, what's he talking about? You're going to understand when I'm done. Watch this now. The boys in our youth group, when we went on a trip that was overnight, the girls never carried their luggage. The guys had to carry the luggage for the girls. In fact, they had to carry mine and Lady Brenda's luggage because we wanted them to understand something. You, when we get to the cabin, when we get to the hotel, wherever we are going, none of our young ladies need to carry it. Where'd that big fly come from? <laughs> Talk about a distraction. Here we go. <laughs> now watch this. We would make them stand outside the bus. They could not get on the bus until all the ladies were safely on that bus. When we went to youth camp, they would have to go in, they would have to clean the camp, and they would have to sweep it out, and we could not leave until that cabin looked better going out than it did coming in. And Lady Brenda and I would make them go back four or five times until they got that cabin clean. And listen to me, I want you to understand something, men. As their youth pastor, I did those things with them because I didn't want them to think, as many do, that we're a male who barks out orders, but rather we are men and we give directions and then we lead by example because men live to serve and not to be served. A third reason we have the crisis is number three. Here we go now. Parents' obsession with protecting their children from everything. Mm -hmm. Here we go now. Stay with me. We do this to our sons and our daughters. We think we can protect them from everything. And because we think that, we have a generation of entitled individuals that are plagued with what the, at the experts call failure to thrive. Everybody say failure to thrive. Now watch this. We got generations of young people. They can't do anything for themselves. They don't work to pay for anything for themselves. They can't take anything. They whine and complain about how hard life is, even though they have done absolutely nothing for themselves thus far in life. They never worked a lick in their life because you know that would be too much pressure if they had to work while going to school and going to college. You know they got to have a life. Somebody give me a life. Let me talk to you for a minute. It took me longer than the average man to get out of college because I decided as a teenager that my parents should not pay for everything in my life. They paid enough. My mother gave me birth. My father let me stay in the earth. And so they don't need to do anything else for me. Let me talk to you. And so what we've done... It's created a generation of beings that are plagued with the disease of failure to thrive. Let me give a medical speaking according to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Failure to thrive is defined medically as decelerated or arrested physical growth, where height and weight measurements fall below the third and fifth percentile, or a downward change in growth across two major percentiles, and is associated with abnormal growth and development. Now, in social terms, watch this. 
generation Y, those who are born between 1981 and 1986, the millennials, they have failed to thrive in regard to their living situation. In a 2016 Pew Research, it found out that for the first time living at home with parents, now listen to me, not out of need, but out of desire, has become the most common situation for adults born in those years. Census suggests that the reality of young people moving back home is more and more common. And again, let me say something. I I know it's expensive to live in Massachusetts. I know that they would rather that you starve to death so you can pay rent than to make the rent at a place where you can afford it and still eat. I know that. But please understand something. Young people are moving back home, not out of, necessary of uh, necess necessity of finances, but they are moving back because they want somebody else to pay their way. And many researchers believe it is a trend that is here to stay. Now, why is this important? Dr. Jean Twinge, who believes that the housing scenario is part of a larger development happening in Generation Y and Generation Z, says this. The entire developmental pathway has slowed down, she says. Younger kids aren't given much dependence and responsibility as they used to, and it's taken longer to grow into adulthood. Now, let me help us. I left home when I was 22 years old. Lady Brenda left home when she was 18, and we have never gone back home. Now, let me say something. And we had some hard times early on. We had to call our parents and ask for help once in a while. But let me tell you what we understood. Most of the time, we toughed it out because we understood that going back home was not going to mature us. And let me tell you the fact of the matter. My father said, you can come visit anytime you want, but don't move back home. <laughs> now, let me talk to you. It caused us to grow up, to mature quickly. And then I look around and I see a world that is in danger. If these are our future leaders and it's getting no better with the generations, those young people coming after the millennial generation, whom Twinge called iGen, listen to what she says, are putting off adulthood in every way. They're less likely to get a driver's license to date, have sex. Thank God they're not having sex before they should and drink alcohol at the same age of previous generations. Now, I'm glad that the generations are holding off on some of these things, but here's why I share this with you. More and more, we are creating generations of young people who are taking the saying, don't grow up too fast, too far. Watch me now. Young people today thinks that that means don't grow up and don't mature if you don't feel like it ever. Watch this now. You know that without a doubt, I am not encouraging young people to have sex or drink alcohol, but let me tell you what her remarks say to me. It shows us a bigger picture of how we are enabling our boys to stay immature and of them seeking refuge from the accountability that they need that will move them forward and toward their intended design. What is God's design for us males? Everybody say manhood. Now watch this. Some of you parents won't even put your child in the nursery. And you won't do it because, you know, he can't defend himself. He might get hit. Well, maybe so, because they might be the one that started the fight. <laughs> well, I'm not going to put my kid down there because she might fall down and get bruised. Listen to me. Yes, they might. Our kids did. Our kids got hit. They fell down. They lost teeth. But let me tell you something. Part of growing into adulthood is learning to take the bumps and the bruises when they are small children because when they are not, then they're not shocked about life because the inevitable is going to happen. There are bruises that are more painful than physical bru bruises. They are called emotional bruises in life when people may turn on them and they may hurt them. And please, please listen to these words. When we do everything for our children and we protect them from everything in life, we enable them. And I want to give you the end result of always enabling a child. Please write this down. When you enable a boy, when you enable a boy, you disable a man. When you enable a boy, you disable a man. I am amazed at how many little boys who have fathers that are men's men, yet they raise their sons to be weak. Parents who won't let them play hard. 
won't let them fall down. This is a prelude to things that we, you know, we must protect our children from. Now, everybody look at me. There are some things you should protect your children from. There are some things you need to get out of the way, though, and let them deal with some of the things that will not kill them. We have got to let them learn that even though it pains us for them to learn the hard way, we've got to let them go through some things in life. Otherwise, they will not grow up. Now watch. Here is why I'm saying what I'm saying and why it's happening. If we didn't have a healthy relationship with our fathers, or didn't have a healthy man come into our lives to help us navigate the tough stuff in life, here's what we do. We either overcorrect or we undercorrect. It's not either or, it's the balance. Listen now, and the way you were raised, fathers, you will go one way or the other. If you were raised in a home where physical discipline was out of control, you will either do the same and go overboard on how you discipline, or you will do what most parents do today, and that is not discipline at all. Because you may be, as one father said to me, he said, I didn't discipline my child because I was fearful of going too far. And therefore, that father let that child get away with any and everything. And what he had to learn and what we have to learn is that there are healthy ways to discipline because when we raise our children without discipline, listen to me now, we set them up for the possibility of great pain in the future because they will grow up thinking the world owes them something. They will grow up thinking that they can have what they want whenever they want it. They will grow up thinking that they can behave any way they want to and they can disrespect anybody they want to. Now listen, I said to my wife the other day, it's a good thing that God didn't let me become a public high school teacher. Now I'm just being serious, because the first time Junebug raised his hand at me, I'm just saying. Let me talk to you. My father used to say to me, he says, boy, he told all of his sons, I'm going to make sure I knock the chip off of your shoulder so nobody else does it and kills you. Let me say something. Undercorrecting and overcorrecting are dangerous, but most of all, when we protect our children from everything in this life, we cripple our boy's ability to go from male to manhood. Let me say it again. When you enable a boy, you disable a man. And then the most prevalent reason we have this crisis of grown males is number four. This one is mine. Consistent voices of negative family cultural influence. Negative family cultural influence. I want to borrow an illustration from a speaker I heard named Simon T. Bailey, and I want to make it my own. He said, whenever you are going to a new level, men, you have to break through the sound barrier. On October 14, 1947, a small, almost rocket-type plane called the Bell X-1 was dropped from a large B-29. Captain Chuck Yeager fired the X-1 engine and was accelerated past the sound barrier. He became the first man to travel faster than the speed of sound. The speed at which sound travels is known as the sound barrier. The speed of a sound wave actually varies with temperature and air density, increasing at about 0.6 ms for every centigrade degree temperature increase. In other words, at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, speed of sound is about 343 ms or 767 miles at sea per hour at sea level. Exactly why? Why is this called the sound barrier? Stay with me now. A plane produces the sound that radiates out from the front of the plane in all directions. The waves propagating in front of the plane get crowded together by motion of the plane as the plane approaches the speed of sound. The sound waves pile up on each other, compressing the air, and in the air in front of the plane, it exerts a force on the plane, impeding its motion, so that as the plane approaches the speed of sound, it approaches this invisible pressure barrier set up by the sound waves just ahead of the plane. The compressed air in front of the plane exerts a much larger than usual force on the plane. There is a notable, noticeable increase of aerodynamic drag on the plane at this point, hence the notion of breaking the sound barrier. Now watch this. 
When a plane exceeds the speed of sound, it is said to be supersonic. Often supersonic speeds are referred to in terms of Mach numbers. The Mach number is the speed of the object divided by the speed of sound. This Mach 3 means three times the speed of sound. Now listen very closely. Anything exceeding the speed of sound creates what is called a sonic boom. An airplane, a bullet, or the tip of a bullwhip can create this effect. They all produce a crack. But here's the most important part of what I just said. The pressure change created by the sonic boom can be quite damaging. In the case of airplanes, shock waves have been known to break windows and buildings. Sound waves, listen, they're so powerful that they have application beyond aviation. Do you know that kidney and gallstones are broken up by the technique of the sound wave, by the breaking through of the sound bearer? Watch this now. This technique uses waves that are outside our normal hearing range, a shock wave produced outside the body, and forced by a reflector so that it converges on the stones. The stress created by the shock waves caused the stones to be broken into small pieces that can be eliminated. Now, if I'm you sitting out there, I'd be saying, now why did he give us all of that scientific knowledge? Here's why. I'm glad you asked. 1 Corinthians 14 and 10 from the American Standard Version. There are, it may be, so many voices in the world and no kind is without signification. But I really like the way the complete Jewish Bible reads. Listen to what it says. There are undoubtedly all kinds of sounds in the world and none is altogether meaningless. Now listen to me men and listen to me ladies. Here's a word for all of us today, especially men. We take the power and the influence of words over our lives much too lightly. Paul says there are all kinds, many, many voices, and every last one of them, listen to me, every voice you let in, every word spoken enters into your soul, your thought life, and not one of them is insignificant. And so many men, you've had such a, tr a struggle going from malehood to manhood because of all the negative voices, all the negative sounds that you have heard that have entered your mind down through the years of the voices of fathers saying bad things about you, telling you you'll never be anything. Now watch this. And for some of you, those voices are recent. Watch what Simon Bailey then says. Whoever has your ear has your mind and your life. Listen to me, men. Whenever you are going to a new level, you have got to break the sound barrier. You have got to shatter some words and some thoughts that have set up in your life. They are in your soul. They're like kidney stones. They're like gallstones. Have you ever had a kidney stone? Ask Pastor Lopez. He will tell you. They can not only be painful, they can be debilitating. He has had to go to the hospital more than once to have them taken out because you have to understand it will limit your mobility. Every time you go to move, it reminds you that it's in there. When you are motionless, sometimes it will sit as though it's stagnant, but you begin to move and all of a sudden it reminds you again that without you getting it out, it will continue to cause you all kinds of pain. It will cause you the inability to move freely. Listen now, and it will never never leave you unless you force it out. And some of you men, you have some thoughts about yourself that are like kidney stones. They're like gallstones that have been deposited into your life by a father who did nothing but mock you. He beat you down, degraded you, telling you you will never do anything. Please do not take the words of your father lightly or the words that were not spoken to you. For 50 years, Bruce Springsteen, the rock icon, turned his struggle into songs, his unrest into performance. What am I talking about? His father cast a long and mostly dark shadow over his life, said Michael Haney in Esquire. Springsteen admits that his entire career was largely, it has been a response and a reaction to attempt to free himself from Doug Springsteen, a hard-drinking, blue-collar New Jerseyite who bounced from job to job. Listen to what Bruce Springsteen said. My mother was kind and compassionate and very considerate of others' feelings. 
My father looked at all those things as weaknesses. He was very dismissive of who I was. His father dominated the family home. He radiated a menace as he sat in the darkness in the kitchen, drinking and brooding. Later in his life, he was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. But before that happened, he would sit there spewing words of negativity at Bruce that settled like kidney stones into his soul. Listen to what he said. I repeat what he said. He says, and for 50 years, I used music and performance. Because what was he trying to do, church? He was seeking to shatter the kidney stones of pain, trying to break through the sound barrier of negative words that sat in his soul from words deposited by his father into his soul. Hear what I said. For 50 years. After Springsteen became famous and wealthy, his father said to him, you've been good to us, and I wasn't good to you. When his father died at the age of 73, Springsteen stayed behind after the graveside funeral. He took a shovel in his hand to finish the burial with his own hands, and he said, I wanted that connection. It meant a lot to me, but listen, somebody asked Bruce Springsteen if he ever heard his father say the words, I love you. He said, no, the best you could get when you asked and said, Pop, I love you. Is his father would become gruff and say, yeah, me too. He said even after he had a stroke and he'd been crying, he'd still go, me too. But he said most of all, he remembers the harsh and abusive words his father released on him and his mother. And he said, I turned my struggle into songs and my unrest into performance. Let me tell you the other side of the coin. There are some of you men in this room. You can't handle a strong woman because your heart still reverberates from the mean words that your mother spoke over you when you were growing up. Cruel words. Ladies, listen to me. Listen to me. Someone said this. Don't kick a man in his finances, his masculinity, or his ability to satisfy you. If you can't address it with sensitivity and love, then leave it alone. Or he's not for you. Amen. And men, you need to really grasp, and even ladies, but men grasp this. It does matter who has your ear. Someone said this, my therapist said, I don't think you have social anxiety. I think you're surrounded by the wrong people. And it really hit me. The entire time you may think it's you, it may just be the people around you are toxic or do not align with you. Be very careful who you let in. Amen. Now watch. Men, let me take us a little bit further. We have got to break through the sound barrier when it comes to the culture of this hour. Because as Dr. Robert Watkins says, our culture hates masculinity and God. Church, listen to me very closely now. We are living in a time and culture where society does not yet realize that we are paying the price for the last 40 years of attacking men and masculinity. Stay with me. On January 13, 2012, an Italian cruise ship, the Costa Concordia, partially sank off the coast of Tuscany with 4,252 people on board. 32 people died and 65 were injured. But listen, the captain, Francisco Chatino, was charged with abandoning incapacitated passengers and failing to inform maritime authorities. Crew members were not much more help, as passengers reported that many of them left them to fend for their now, Richard Lowry at National Review compared the crash of the Consta Concordia to the Titanic and how men responded to each. Listen to what he said. Every man for himself is a phrase associated with the deadly, deadly Costa Concordia disaster. An Australian mother and her young daughter have described being pushed aside by hysterical men as they tried to board lifeboats. And a grandmother complained, I was standing by the lifeboats and men, big men, were banging into me and knocking the, and knocking the girls. If the men of the Titanic had lived to read such a thing, they would have recoiled in shame. The Titanic's crew surely would have thought the hysterics deserved to be shot on sight and would have volunteered to perform the service. Now listen to me. When I read that, I thought, 
Lowry is blaming men for what happened on the Concordia. Listen to me very closely. I understand where he's coming from, but I think he overlooks the real issue. I think he overlooks the cause by leaping to the effect. Let me tell you what the cause is, church. The guy's behavior is a culmination that has been years in the making. Stay with me now. Our society, our culture, the media, the government, and even the church and women have demanded that any incentives men have for acting like men, that they be taken away and they have described masculinity as evil. Now we are seeing the result. Men have been listening to what society and the culture and the world have been saying about us for more than 40 years and you have heard it. Listen now. They have said things like all men are perverts, wimps, cowards, jerks, good for nothing, bumbling deadbeats and expendable. Well, listen to me. Men got the message, and now they are acting accordingly. We are finding out that Galatians 6 and 9 is true. As you sow, so shall you reap. Stay with me, church. The Concordia is just a microcosm of what is happening in our greater society. What we're really seeing, church, is men are opting out in response to the attack on our gender. Listen to me now. A society and a culture cannot spend more than 40 years tearing down half of the population and then expect them to respond with give me another forever. The war on men is suicidal for our society and it's got to stop. And treating men like the enemy is dangerous both to men and to the society that needs their positive participation as fathers and husbands and role models and leaders. Let me take it a step further. Mitch Album, the author of the international bestseller Tuesdays with Maury, wrote a short, art, short article for Father's Day. It was titled, When Did Fathers Become Expendable? Album described what happened on a recent exchange of the view. Now, everybody look at me for a moment. I love women, but the view, it does nothing but try to castrate men emotionally and spiritually. And here is another example of that. On one of those shows with this massive female audience, watch what happened. A guest host, an actor named Terry Crews, had floated the idea that there are some things only a father can give you. He was deluged by objection both on social media and on the set when he said a father gives you your name. Co-host Whoopi Goldberg joked, like the Lion King. When he said a father gives you your security and your confidence, co-host Jenny McCarthy, who is raising her son on her own, shot back. I'm a single mother and I guarantee you I can give my son all those things. The debate went on for several minutes at a high volume with female hosts paying homage to widows, single moms, and gay couples, and McCarthy hammering at the idea that her amazing son needs no man. Album pondered how far we've come, that on network TV suggesting there are some things only a father can give you is greeted not with agreeing nods, but with cannon fire. He offered this analysis, listen. What does a father bring to the table? I can cite a few things I got from my own. Strength, quiet confidence, discipline, responsibility, and love all displayed differently than my mother, which is fine. My father also taught us how to be a husband, how to respect a woman, when to lead, and when to support. It's true, not all men are like my dad, but plenty are. And fatherhood didn't suddenly, after thousands of years, lose its value. It may be trendy to dismiss dads as little more than fertilizer, but it's not true. In fact, it's pretty foolish, such as our world, where a comment like Cruz's brings a tsunami. Funny thing is, I remember someone from my childhood frequently saying, he needs a father to do that. It was my mother. See, men, society and culture is releasing a tsunami on us. That tells us we are not needed, we're useless, we're all perverts, we're cowards, we're jerks, we're good for nothing, we are bumbling deadbeats, and we are expendable. 
I'll never forget when I was doing a child, a baby dedication, and many of the mothers that were standing here were single mothers, and I made a statement similar to this effect. I said, I want you to understand that you don't have to be a father to your children. I am praying, though, that God will insert some mature man into your life. You don't have to date him, but that he will invest in your child and help your child to grow up with a father image there. And I watched this one single mother. as She shook her head vehemently, and I saw her mouth back to me. I don't need a man. You see, even many in the church no longer believe nor understand the value of a man. The church now so devalues the man that we will make no bones about putting women in leadership positions that biblically should be held by men. Now listen to me, and I know that males have brought some of this on ourselves. When it comes to the church, but ladies, I want you to hear me. We are in a moment in the body of Christ where God is raising us men up. And we need some women who will be the kind of women who will look at men and tell you, I know what you are, but I can see in the spirit realm what you can become. And we need to start building up our men. Listen. We have got to stop this flood of males masquerading as men. Now listen to me, ladies. Please understand what I'm saying. Not every guy is going to obey what I just instructed. Not every guy is going to rise up. But there are many of us who want to. And men, you have got to break through the sound barrier of this culture and society. And any other voices that seek to demean you and to delay your pursuit of manhood. Psalm 119 and 30, the psalmist says, I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. If you're going to break through the sound barrier of the words that have been spoken into your lives, men, if you're going to destroy those emotional kidney stones in your spirit, you've got to break through the sound barrier. And when you do that, the only way to do it is that above all, you've got to start believing about yourself, not what your father said, not what society said, not what your teacher said, some of you, not even what women said to you. You've got to believe what God has said about you. And let me say something else, men. It's not enough to know to change. You've got to want to change. Norville Woolfolk was one of those old preachers who's probably with the Lord that Lady Brenda and I knew in Chicago. And he preached a message that has stayed with me. The sermon title was, you got to want to. And every once in a while, he'd say, you can do this, but you got to want to. Dr. Tony Evans is right. He says it can be rough changing people who don't want to change. But then he gives us the way to change if we want to change, man. Listen to what he says. A man has to accept culture will no longer define him. God will define him. And everyone else has to adjust. You will bring your faith into the culture and not be defined by the culture. Here is the problem with the church. We have been allowing the culture to define who we are. But I'm looking for some men in this house who will determine that from this day forward, we're not going to be moved by the culture. We're going to change the culture. Culture. One more thing. If we're going to break the sound barrier, man, we got to stop feeling sorry for ourselves. We got to quit feeling sorry for the things we didn't get when we were growing up or the, the father we didn't have when we were growing up. I'm still touched by the young man who is sitting in this service right now. And again, I paraphrase. He said, I came to a point where I had to stop using my father as an excuse to be an excuse. Lionel Shriver said this. Some people coddle their own afflictions the way others spoil small pedigree dogs with cans of pate. Selah. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Number one, the divide between males and men is authenticity. Authenticity. Let's go back to the beginning for a moment. We began this series by talking about some of the childish behaviors that separate the men from males who are masquerading as men. And the second, second symptom was addressed was the reality that males use the past as, as an excuse to remain an excuse. In other words, the past is the reason they can never grow into a man that God designed them to be. Now, the main reason I believe that we men can never grow into the men God designed us to be is that if we're going to get past our past and to a better future, we have got to deal with our pain. And listen, pain will always hinder your pursuit from male to man if you don't deal with it. Please understand this. If you do not deal, you cannot heal. 
and what you don't deal with, man, it will eventually deal with you. Listen now, when I talk about authenticity, what I'm talking about is the reality that some males will never become men because they will never talk about and get the help that they need to overcome and heal their pain. And let me say something, it's a touchy subject, but I want all of us to understand something. If you don't deal with the trauma in your life, you can suppress it for a while until something traumatic happens in your life, men, and then the trauma will rise to the top, and here's the danger, that trauma will cause you to cause pain to those that you love dearly, because now your trauma has once again owned you. 2002, Joe, how do I say his last name, Shauna? Maganello. That's close enough. I said it. I'm going to say Joe. Is that an Italian name? Oh, I need my Italian folks to help me. <laughs> and you, woman of God, have the right. You've been around here a long time. But trust me, it's not going to help. So I'm going to say Joe right now. This guy landed at his first screen screenshot the role of Flash Thompson in Spider-Man 3. In 2003, it was the biggest film of the year. That kind of thing never happens. It is said that he had all the luck, incredible talent, great looks, and unfortunately a serious drinking problem. Listen to what he said when he talked to health, men's health, Molly Knight. Listen to what he said. He said, there was a point where I really thought I was broken beyond the point of being able to be fixed. Watch this now. Drinking was a way for me not to deal with me. And I think that acting was a way for me not to have to be me either. So I could go on stage and not be me, come off stage and go to the bar and not be me. Rinse and repeat. I needed to really look in the mirror and get honest with myself about the man that I wasn't becoming. It goes on to say in the article, his identity crisis was serious enough that he didn't act for four years. To earn a living, he took jobs as a DJ, as a roadie for the band Goldfinger, and on the back of a masonry truck doing deliveries and demolitions. He credits eight hours a day of jackhammering with turning his life around. But listen to what he said. Hard physical labor is the best work you can do for your soul, even if it's gardening. When the magazine asked him what being a man meant to him now, his answer is as traditional as it gets. He says it's the same as it is and always has been. You protect number one and take care of children, women, animals, and the planet. You tell the truth. If I hurt somebody, I apologize immediately. Also, I hold the door open for my wife. Listen to me now. Men, we need to understand. He went from behaving like a male to becoming a man only because, listen now, he decided it was time to deal with the pain that was in his heart. Watch now. Pain is touchy to us men, isn't it? It makes us want to run until, and continue to run until we feel that we're far away from as accountability as possible. But here's the tragic reality of a lack of accountability. If you don't get your accountability in place, you will never get the healing and the restoration that you need to actually function as a man. Let me say it again. If you don't deal with your pain, men, your pain will deal with you. Listen to the words of Dondre Whitfield. He says, when we arrive on earth as God's creation, we are like a blank slate that has not yet been written on by others. Each day, each second, second, we are affected by the teachings of imperfect beings who have become flawed by their own experiences, yet other imperfect beings. We, in turn, create more imperfect be people with further flawed experiences, and yet we are expected to be great individuals despite these encounters. We are continually becoming who we are and never arrive at a specific state of being. Now, let me tell you why I like that statement. What that statement tells me is that it doesn't matter how my beginning was. I could still have a great future.
It doesn't matter if I was raised in a severely dysfunctional family. It does not have to cripple me. It doesn't matter what happened along the way in my past. It does not have to be an excuse. Let me say it one more time. Men, we need to come to the place where we understand your past explains you, but it does not have to define you. Somewhere, we got to change our definition. Now, I'm going to get to my last point, but let me lead you into it with this. I found out that even though Loida likes the Patriots and I like the Cowboys, we do have something in common. We both love the show Law and Order. Now, there was this episode of Law and Order in which a young man was repeatedly tortured by his father. And his father was torturing him because he thought that if he abused him enough, he would force him to become a man. Now listen to me very closely. What we have got to understand is that abuse is not the same thing as discipline. Because the matter of the fact is that a lot of us grew up in homes where we were not spanked, we were beaten. We just didn't know we were being beaten. <laughs> now, <laughs> this is not a racial statement, but it's a very true statement. And while this can be true of all of my friends that were raised in Caucasian families, this is very true of many minority families even today. Many of us have been conditioned to believe that abuse and discipline are the same thing, and they are not. But with that said, I'm watching this show, and as a result of the abuse of the father, that boy says, I'm going to show him that I'm a man. And when you don't understand what it means to be a man, then you get this misconception. And when we do that, we act out in ways we shouldn't. And so he made the decision to let aggression lead the way to prove that he was a man. He gained access to his father's rifles and he shot up the school. Fortunately, the boy was eventually disarmed and taken into custody. But I want you to see this. What really amazed me about this show was that the district attorney wanted the father brought in before the court also in order that he might be held accountable for the sins of the son. Grab that now, the sins of the son. And though this is a fictional account, it drives home a very non-fictional reality. This is a far too common example of what happens when sons are raised in this manner and fathers project the pain of their past onto their sons. Watch this now. The sons end up being raised in the ways of the fathers who are grown males who are wearing the attire of a man but are far from actually being one. They are incapable. Listen to me what I learned. A man is incapable of teaching his son to be a man if he himself has never been taught to be a man. Listen, so what happens? This boy, they go up and they go unfathered even though there's a male figure in the home. And so both the father and the son go unfathered because of a lack of accountability and the messaging that they need to understand what it means to be a man. Listen to Dondre Whitfield again. When that happens, being unfathered is a dangerous proposition for any male, but even more so for the society that will eventually have to deal with him. So here's my last point. Listen to me, men. No male bridges the divide between males and men without being fathered. It doesn't happen. And I've heard young men whose fathers died when they were small children make the statement, I don't need a father. I had a father. Let me tell you something. If a father dies prematurely in your life, that can hurt you too. Proverbs 22 and 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Most of us know this scripture by heart, and the word train means to admonish them in the ways of the Lord that he should go in. But what in reality does admonish mean? What does it mean? It means that we need to give our boys, listen, a blueprint for their manhood as we raise them. If a boy is raised by a father that is merely a grown male, or as it was for so many of my friends, his upbringing is devoid of a father's presence. Believe me when I tell you this. Except for a miracle, he is set up to be a problem waiting to happen. Listen to me, men. 
This is something that sending them to college will not fix. You need to understand because what we do is we fathers sometimes place a greater emphasis on college education than we do on their spiritual education and their nurtured education. I love something else that Dondre Whitfield says. He says, even though nature dictates many outcomes in a boy's life, nurture has the unique and wonder-working ability to change his trajectory. When no one has nurtured a boy or given him the proper lessons, what does he do? What does he do when no one has trained him in the ways of the Lord? He chooses the ways shown by his culture. And all of that is against the ways of God and who God is. Look at me for a moment. When I was in the sixth grade, my best friend, his father and my father were best friends. His father was an alderman and he asked my father to travel with him to a suburb of Chicago when he had a meeting. They took my, my friend's father's car. Three times they had a flat tire. On two of the occasions, my father got out in the pouring rain and he changed the tire. The third time, when the tire went flat, my friend's father said to my father, give me your coat, I will get out and change the tire. He gets out, he's changing the tire. The next thing my father hears and he feels is the thud of another car striking the back of the car. It sent the car into a ditch. There were no bucket seats at that time. The car that struck them struck them so hard that literally the seat in the front broke and when they came back two weeks later, my father's indentation in the back seat was still there. In the process of hitting that car, my father's best friend was killed because the car hit him, severed his leg, and he was lying on the highway. And my father walked up and literally saw him laying there with blood gushing from his body. Now, as tragic as that is, let me tell you the powerful part of this story. There were three of those boys. Every one of them today loves God. They are successful. And they have families that are being successful. Let me tell you how it happened. When my friend's father died, his brother, watch this now, stepped in watch, married their mother. They had no relationship sexually. He married her for one reason. He says, you will never financially want again in your life and your sons will always have their father's name. And he invested in their lives from the time we were 12 years old until they were able to go away to college. Are you hearing me, men, about the power of a man of God? Don't let the society tell you we're in, that we're expendable. Don't let the society tell you that we are not of value. I leave you with this. The greatest rapper is called by the name Eminem. I don't know what that means, but... I know I like M&Ms, but, you know. He has 11 Grammy Awards. It's obvious that young men cling to his message. But in his autobiographical song, Cleaning Out My Closet, his rage is palpable when he speaks about his father who abandoned him when he was just a few months old. Listen to what he says. He says, I wonder if he ever kissed me goodbye. No, on second thought, I just wish he would die. Then they asked him, would you like to meet your father? He said, I don't know. I, I don't know. Some people ask me that, and I don't think I do. If my kids were moved to the edge of the earth, I'd find them. No doubt in my mind, no money, no nothing. If I had nothing, I'd find my kids. So there's no excuse. There's no excuse. Amen? Amen. I have great hope at Eagle Heights because I see men becoming men. I see males 
who have stepped up and are becoming men. And that's my prayer for you, that you will just keep on growing, keep on going and listen to me. And I'm going to pray for you. It is never too late. Never too late. Bow your heads. Father, I pray for the men under the sound of my voice. Lord, I pray that they would be the men who would decide today again anew that you're looking for somebody to make up the heads to stand in the gap so you won't destroy this land. And may they say, I will be that man. And then they become to know, as Isaiah said, that they shall be the restorers of paths to dwell in. They shall be those who will restore generation after generation after generation. I thank you for the men that are right now serving in youth ministry who said, I want to go down there and I want to be an example to young men of the great grace and the power of God, of how you can change their lives. And may they see the example that you can love God and still truly be a man. Now I ask favor and blessing over every man under the sound of my voice. Use them for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. And every day I look to you to be the strength of my life. You're the hope. You're the To be the strength of my life, be the strength of my life, be the strength of my life, be the strength of my life today. his will for your life that he might be the strength of your life I pray that for you so lift up your holy hands now may the Lord bless you and protect you may the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you may the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace amen Eagle Heights Cathedral, it's been amazing to worship with you once again. I want to remind you that to stay up to date on our upcoming events and activities, you can visit us at ehconline.org, and you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We look forward to worshiping with you next Sunday.